Today on The Real Story, a desegregation deal, three decades in the making. The state reaches an agreement in connection with a landmark civil rights case, Sheff versus O'Neill. Attorney General William Tong announced the breakthrough and he's our first guest this morning. Are tolls coming back or aren't they? At week's end, Democrats said they were putting the finishing touches on a tolls bill. Republicans said they can't wait to get their hands on it. And we're talking with a key Republican, State Senator Henry Martin, ranking member of the Transportation Committee. What do you think should Connecticut open its presidential primaries to unaffiliated voters? Former candidate for governor Oz Griebel is back in the political spotlight, not running for office this time, but he is pushing for open primaries. And he's with us to explain why. All today on The Real Story. Hello there, you're watching The Real Story. I'm Al Terzi alongside Jen Bernstein. Thank you, Alan. Good morning to everyone at home. It's a breakthrough, a long time coming. Finally, an agreement reached in Sheff versus O'Neill, the landmark civil rights case that was filed 30 years ago over the racial and economic segregation of students in Hartford and surrounding towns. And joining us first this morning to tell us about this deal, guy who's been working on it since he became Attorney General, Attorney General William Tong. How are you? Good, Good to see you both. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Uh, it, it was, what's the headline on this? So after 30 years, we have a settlement, a two-part settlement of one of the most complex and important cases in our state's history, and that's Sheff versus O'Neill. Um, it's our long, decades-long effort to desegregate Hartford schools and to provide a quality education, a quality integrated education to every student in Hartford in the region. How does this deal do that? Well, it makes a huge or start doing it. It makes a huge investment in Hartford schools, Hartford Magnet schools, schools that are run by CREC, and uh, provides many more seats. We estimate three, four, five hundred more seats, and also provides a lot of support uh, for students who choose to go outside of Hartford through the Open Choice Program and access uh, educational opportunities in the suburbs, and also supports. Hartford neighborhood schools. So it does all of those things immediately and then puts us on a path to a final agreement in two and a half years. That's why it's a two part settlement. But, you know, this is a big deal because um, over these 30 years, we haven't been able to come to a final agreement that puts us on a path to resolving the whole litigation. As soon as I became Attorney General, I empowered Joe Rubin, one of the most senior lawyers in our state, and I said, Joe, you got to go in there and try to resolve this thing and try to settle it. And with my blessing and the governor's encouragement, we made that happen. Why did it take 30 years to come to this moment? What was the sticking point? You know, it's, it's really complicated. There are uh, a lot of logistical issues about how to build a system that reduces what the Supreme Court found to be racial and ethnic isolation. Um, you know, how do you define a substantially equal educational opportunity? That was very difficult. Working with many different cities and towns to make this happen. And there are a lot of legal issues. And this moves to a model where we focus on the socioeconomic status of students. We think that opens it up. It's a game changer. There are a lot of studies um, that showed us that this is the right way to go. And I think it took 30 years to figure that out. But um, I'm really glad to say that um, the plaintiffs and the state and the city of Hartford and the NAACP, we came together. Um, sat down. Uh, Elizabeth Horton Chef was there the other day. Mother we, of Milo Chef. Uh, mother of Milo Chef, who's now 41 years old. Imagine that. And, the time uh, has passed. And we made it happen. And sometimes it's just a matter of sitting down face to face and really committing to having a conversation. And they did that over the last year. I see that it uh, adds more than a thousand new magnet school seats. Yeah. But how does that compare with what the real demand is? Well, I think there's very significant demand. I think people know that there are great schools in this region, and so this opens it up uh, much more than it has been in the past so that people can take advantage of those great schools. Is it the state that would foot the bill on those students with charter schools? I know yeah, charter in part, school in pay large is part. complicated. So the State Department of Education has money um, allocated in this current budget. It doesn't need new money. Um, How much money do you know? Uh, you know, it's less um, than um, uh, generally it requires uh, us to go to the legislature when um, something requires more than two and a half million dollars. It's less than that, but it's moving around uh, resources that are already there that are focused on tackling desegregation and that are focused on 
uh, ensuring that every Hartford student and every student in the region has a quality education and a quality integrated education. So they're moving that money in place. Um, and so we don't foresee that it requires any uh, new money from the legislature at this time. I see that there's, uh, there are incentives in this deal for suburban communities sure. to open up. Uh, how, how reluctant have suburban communities been here? Well, I think we've got some really great partners uh, in the region and uh, a number of communities have stepped up and this encourages them to do even more and encourages other communities who uh, maybe haven't been as active in this space to often more open choice spots to students here in Hartford and the region. So again, this resets the table and, and represents a sea change because everybody is at the table. Everybody agrees this is the way forward. And I think we're on a path to finally resolving this once and for all after 30 years. This two-part agreement, the second part you said would be in two years? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. So that part hasn't fully been agreed upon yet? That's right. You're going to go through the motions with what was agreed upon and then you kind of reconvene and see if it's been successful or not? Or? That's right. But what's been agreed upon right now in the opening of seats, the way we're shifting to a socioeconomic model, the way we're supporting open choice students, the way we're marketing uh, to meet demand and to increase demand, all of those are the building blocks of a final agreement. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's a two-part settlement because a lot of heavy lifting is being done now. And, and uh, it puts us on a path to a final resolution in two and a half years. And this, we resolve this major 30-year um, litigation. We also resolve the um, litigation with the hospitals. So that's two major exposures that uh, the Office of the Attorney General and the governor have come together on and we have brought the parties together and, and settled both of those huge cases. How does this process work when uh, a family wants to get uh, uh, their children into uh, a magnet school seat? Where do they apply and how long does the process take and how is the decision made? Is it they're drawing names from a hat? or So there's a process and I guess um, the best way to describe it is it's a lottery-based placement process. Uh, but the key difference now is that it'll be focused uh, entirely on the student's socioeconomic background and status, which is measured using census data. It's not on a student-by-student -student basis. It's on a, uh, it's on a census data-driven basis. Uh, and, and, and that will really, um, based on the modeling that we've done and the state has done and the studies that we've seen in other parts of the country, that'll really juice demand and increase um, the participation of students across the region. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, ask you a question on an unrelated sure. topic. Uh, we've heard about this awful story of this Colchester family in Florida. Um, the husband in that admitted to killing his family. Yeah. Uh, he has been arrested in Florida. And the FBI had uh, an arrest warrant for him for health care fraud. And you had said that your office was also investigating yeah. this man. You can confirm that and tell us what you know well, about it? It's an unfathomable tragedy. Um, and so. Yeah. Thinking first of um, the, the wife and the kids and the people that we've lost. Um, I can only say that the Office of the Attorney General uh, was investigating Mr. Tott um, based on allegations of false claims under our state's False Claims mm -hmm. Act. And beyond that, I can't say any more. Well, okay. We'll leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Attorney General William Tong, for being on Thank with this, uh, this good news, hopeful news. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, well, still to come today on The Real Story, there are almost a million voters in Connecticut who are registered as unaffiliated, not members of either of the major parties. So when our presidential primaries come along in April, they will not be able to vote in them. But former candidate for Governor Oz Griebel wants to change that. We're going to ask him how and why. But next, right after a quick break, we're staying on top of tolls for you and the latest effort by Democrats to bring them back in Connecticut. What's taking so long to put it to a vote? First, it will have to clear the Transportation Committee, perhaps, and ranking member Senator Henry Martin is going to join us. And coming up right after on The Real Story, it's Real People with Stan Simpson. On his show today, The Plight of Puerto Rico. Stan sits down with two Connecticut residents, one of whom was on the ground during the earthquake. So stick around for that. But The Real Story will continue right after a quick break.